of the hour on a Friday. We are coming on the air with a scary thought, a potential nuclear disaster. That's what the Ukrainian president is warning could be coming as he and Vladimir Putin point fingers over a threat to Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Ahead, we're going to break down the threats, how Ukrainians are preparing. Plus, uh, Vanessa Bryant sobbing on the stand as she describes what it was like to find out that sheriff's officers and firefighters apparently leaked photos of her late husband, Lakers legend Kobe Bryant, and their daughter at the crash scene. We're going to break down what happened inside the courtroom in L.A. today and an NBC News exclusive on the tail end of a summer of travel meltdowns. The transportation secretary is telling us and the nation's airlines that they have got to step up their game. The new passenger protections and rights that he wants for you for your next flight. In the backstory tonight, we are going behind the scenes on a Houston Chronicle report. Did you see this? How families are leaving Texas because they say the state doesn't do enough to protect kids with disabilities. And a new article on the loneliness of young single men, you heard it right, young single men blowing up the internet. You're gonna be talking about this one over the weekend. We're gonna break down the controversy on these findings later in the show. Good day, I'm Tom Costello filling in for Halley, and we are starting out with new and potentially catastrophic developments in the war in Ukraine. The United Nations is warning of a potential disaster in the standoff over Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Ukraine says Russia is planning an imminent attack on the Zaporizhia plant, which, as you can see from this map, is very close to Russian-controlled areas in the southern Donbass region. There's been shelling back and forth for weeks, but right now, Moscow occupies the plant. Now, we can't stress enough, Ukraine needs this plant to provide power to the rest of the country. But the state-run energy company says Moscow plans to disconnect the plant from Ukraine's power grid. NBC News is also learning from Ukrainian military intel that Russia is telling workers don't show up to work today because Ukrainian forces could attack. We have video obtained by NBC News from inside the plant. And as you can see, Russia seems to be stockpiling tanks. We should note it is not clear when this video was taken. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin actually got on the phone with the French President Emmanuel Macron today. The Kremlin says Putin blamed Ukraine and vowed to let nuclear inspectors go inside, international inspectors. As Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says, the world is on the verge of a nuclear disaster, with the UN Secretary General taking it a step further. We must tell it as it is. Any potential damage to Zaporizhia is suicide. All right, we are now getting word on more U.S. action with the White House unveiling another massive security package, $775 million worth. Megan Fitzgerald is on the ground in Kiev for us. Megan, uh, I want to put up video right here showing Ukrainians walking through response drills in case of a nuclear disaster at Zaporizhia. No reports of attacks at this moment, but give us a sense of just how concerned the Ukrainians are right now. Yeah, Tom, this is an incredibly serious situation um, that certainly seems to be intensifying. Now, we know that Ukrainian energy officials have said that they have intelligence that suggests that uh, Russia is actively working towards shutting that plant down. Uh, that's something that experts say is, is of grave concern uh, because it's such a process to try and shut this plant down. One mistake could lead to a leak at this facility. That leak could then seep out uh, radioactive material that could then spread across Ukraine, spread throughout Europe and even beyond. Uh, now, as you mentioned, we know that the UN uh, Secretary General is in Ukraine. He has called yet again on Russia uh, to allow international scientists inside that plant to do some checks. And as you mentioned again, of course, uh, we know that that was a sentiment that was echoed by the president of France. Uh, Emmanuel Macron on a call today with Vladimir Putin, who says that he's open to that idea. But keep in mind that earlier today, uh, that Russian ministry officials have said that uh, that's something that they would like to see in September. Ukrainian officials are saying, look, this is a dire emergency right now. They want to see these international scientists inside that plant as soon as possible, because this is a serious situation uh, that could change at any hour. 
Tom? First of all, Megan, how far are you from that potential nuclear zone? And second of all, we have some reporting about attacks launched by a Ukrainian-backed group in Crimea. What can you tell us about that? That's right. Well, so we are in Kyiv right now. So, so we're a good distance away from that plant. But again, the big concern is about the winds. If there is a leak, the winds can carry radioactive activity uh, anywhere, really, uh, depending on where the winds go. Uh, as to your other question, we know that according to a uh, Ukrainian official who has confirmed with NBC News saying that it was these pro-Ukrainian uh, saboteurs. So these saboteurs, essentially, uh, another word for them are these guerrilla fighters. They went into uh, Crimea and, and, and executed these attacks on military artillery, uh, along with fighter jets uh, that were stationed there at Crimea. We know that Crimea is incredibly important to Vladimir Putin. Uh, he annexed it, of course, back in 2014. This is where they are holding a lot of their uh, military artillery uh, and jets, of course, as they try and continue this war. So this was a big blow. And, and what we're seeing here uh, by these attacks that took place, two of them, in just a week's time, is that Ukraine is now coming on the offensive as we head into the six-month anniversary of this war. Tom? All right. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald. We worry for all of you, so take care. Megan, thank you very much. All right. When do, we want to turn now to here in Washington, where today the, the chair of the House Oversight Committee is sending letters to eight social media companies demanding that they do more to protect law enforcement. It comes after a spike in violent threats following the FBI search at former President Trump's Florida home. The letters were sent not just to Main Street, mainstream apps like Meta, Twitter and TikTok, but also right wing platforms like Gab and Mr. Trump's own Truth Social. They warn a possible legislative reform if the companies don't take action. Now, that search, as you know, is helping Mr. Trump fundraise big time. NBC News confirms the former president's PAC has raised millions of dollars over the last week and a half as his potential 2024 opponent, former Vice President Mike Pence, is towing the party line. We should be standing with the men and women of law enforcement, and we should recognize we can hold the Attorney General uh, and the Justice Department accountable. We can demand that they reveal why this search warrant was executed against the residents of a former president of the United States uh, without demeaning the rank and file men and women of the FBI. The former president uh, saying the opposite about law enforcement on his social media app, Truth Social, just minutes ago. Mr. Trump says they're viciously and violently involved in politics, talking about the FBI, and they are, quote, destroying our country. NBC News justice correspondent Ken Delaney and joining us now. Ken, uh, we're six days from that DOJ redaction deadline on the affidavit that the judge had approved, but it could still be weeks before we see anything from the affidavit, if anything, right? That's right, Tom, because the judge is going to give the Justice Department a chance to make its case on the redactions, and then he will decide whether he agrees. And if those two parties can't agree, he said he will put it all under seal and allow the Justice Department to appeal. And they can appeal not only to a district court judge, but to the appeals court, even to the Supreme Court, Tom. And then the media companies involved here would also have a chance to appeal if they don't like the redactions, although they will have a disadvantage because they won't know what's beneath the redactions. Um, so, yes, this could go on for some time before we see anything at all, Tom. All right. Talk to me now, if you could, about this alleged FBI surveillance video that the former president may release. I guess our colleague Mark Caputo is downplaying this as a serious discussion within Trump world. Uh, from what you're hearing, though, what's happening on the DOJ side? Are they taking this seriously? Well, it may not be a serious discussion, but Eric Trump went on television and said they were going to release it. We're talking about surveillance video taken by the Trump family's cameras at Mar-a-Lago of the FBI search. And the FBI and the Justice Department are very concerned that if this video is released, it would show the faces of FBI agents at a time when many uh, agents are being threatened. Uh, there's a lot of just you know threats of violence and volatility in the land. And so the Justice Department has actually asked news organizations to blur the faces of any FBI agents who may be uh, shown in that video. You know, it's an interesting question, Tom, how how that video would play politically for for Donald Trump. You know, it's, it's going to show FBI agents carrying boxes out of the former president's home. Um, it, you know, it could cut either way, Tom. NBC's Ken Delanian. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. 
We've got some breaking news out of Atlanta. A federal judge says Senator Lindsey Graham must testify before a grand jury in Fulton County, Georgia's investigation into alleged election interference there in that county. Now, Graham's lawyers argued his comments were protected because they related to legislation, but the judge rejected that, particularly when it comes to his controversial phone call with the Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. Graham's scheduled to testify Tuesday, and appeal is still in the works. Now to an L.A. courtroom where today a very emotional Vanessa Bryant took the stand, at times crying so hard her body shook, at other times gasping for breath as she described in agonizing detail what it was like to learn first responders had leaked photos of the site where her husband, Kobe Bryant, and their daughter, Gianna's helicopter had crashed. Vanessa Bryant saying that when she found out, quote, I broke down and cried and I wanted to run down the block and just scream. The testimony, part of her suit against L.A. County, uh, against its agencies and employees, for sharing photos of human remains from that crash site. Now, Bryant accused them of invading her privacy by sharing the photos without any real purpose, causing her serious emotional distress. Her lawyers say close-up photos of Mr. Bryant and Gianna's remains were passed uh, by text, as well as at a bar and at an awards gala. The L.A. County Sheriff's Department and the sheriff himself has admitted the photos were shared, but says that they were then deleted. NBC's Steve Patterson is in Los Angeles for us. Steve, Vanessa Bryant uh, said that she had to run out of the house when she found out the photos were being shared so her daughters wouldn't see them and cry. Lay out how impactful her testimony was today in that courtroom. You know, Tom, I think it's important to say that this is a different sort of trial than ones we see of similar stature and that it's not necessarily a fact finding mission from the plaintiffs. You know, we know, as you mentioned, that the deputies and the first responders took those photos. That's a fact. They testified to it. We know that they shared those photos. That's a fact. They testified to that as well. So the core of the argument really becomes about making this emotional appeal to the jury and to say that pointing at this process of taking these photos and a point and say that this is wrong, to be able to point and say that this has been destructive to this family, and no better way to do that than to have a woman who had just lost her husband and her daughter and the families of those seven other victims be able to show that anguish in court, that anguish that was so palpable as described by the reporters who were in that courtroom. Uh, I think that did its job very well, Tom. Yeah, so lawyers for L.A. County are saying that the photo, taking photos at a crime scene is common practice for investigative purposes. But clearly sharing those photos at a bar is not professional, not respectful. And maybe the sheriff ordered them deleted, but nothing's deleted when it's electronic, right? Nothing's deleted, and I think it would be very wrong, and I think attorneys have figured out the strategy would be very wrong to say that this is a normal process, because also the sheriff had said earlier, not long after the crash, that the only people that should be taking photos are the NTSB and the coroner's office. So instead, I think their strategy is more focused on the fact that there was a diplomatic process, that there was an internal investigation, that there was a disciplinary process after those photos surfaced and to say that they squashed the ability for those photos to get out to the public very quickly. I think their second strategy is to take the core argument again of the plaintiff, which is that it caused emotional distress, and to say that it would be impossible to cause emotional distress because those photos never did surface to the public, that in the two and a half years since that crash, that not one photo has popped up online anywhere. And so, you know, the distress that Vanessa Bryant is feeling must be from something else, must be from the crash itself. She's being cross-examined as we speak, Tom, and I think that's what they're focused on right now. Probably picking apart, going through her social media history, bringing some of that stuff up and making it seem like there's no way it could have been the photos that were shared, Tom. Oh, boy. Goodness gracious. Well, as you know, uh, I was there uh, during the investigation and other victims, of course. Uh, There were other victims in that crash. And Chris Chester, who lost his wife and daughter in that crash, is also part of a lawsuit, right? So what did the other families want in terms of justice? 
so a few of the lawsuits that are similar have been settled out of court. You know, you could point to, in this case, obviously, you could look at the millions of dollars in punitive damages that would actually be the penalty of the lawsuit. But I think more importantly, and more we, what we've heard from Chester and Vanessa Bryant is a sense of justice, a sense of, you know, being able to say in front of a jury, again, to point and say that this was wrong for them to share their story, to be able to show the process from start to beginning to, to the ending of it, to be able to point and say, this is the truth of what happened. Uh, and this is how emotionally wounded we feel. This is what it's done to our family. And I think they want to put that out there for, for the public. Uh, and that's what's happening as we speak. Tom? You got to wonder, God forbid she ever has to call 911 again, how she's going to feel when they yeah. show up on the scene. Uh, Steve, thank you. Steve Patterson in Los Angeles. All right, turning now to a flash flood threat uh, stretching from Arizona to Texas as parts of the country are parched and other areas are about to get drenched. Nearly 10 million people in the southwest are under a flood watch this weekend. Parts of Arizona and New Mexico could get doused with as much as six inches of rain before the wet weather then makes its way east to Texas. Now, the Weather Prediction Center has issued a rare moderate risk warning for the region. The drought plagued region actually desperately needs the water. Around 70 percent of the West remains in some level of drought, but the rainfall isn't expected to reach areas where water is needed the most, like California, Nevada, Oregon, and northern Utah. NBC meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now. Bill, the Hurricane Center is watching for a, a potential tropical system, right? Yeah, we're, this is breaking news that we're just getting out from the Hurricane Center in Miami. They have said at the 5 o'clock advisor on the East Coast that this area in disturbance in the Bay of Campeche, the southern Gulf of Mexico, is now getting to the point where they think it's almost for sure going to be a tropical depression later on tonight and maybe even a tropical storm tomorrow. So let me get out of the way here and just show you the graphics. The director can pop it up full. So it's this big white blob that you see here in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. That's the system trying to develop. They say right now they're calling this a potential tropical cyclone. Now, it's not a tropical depression yet. It's not quite strong enough, but they usually indicate that this is expected to happen tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, it's moving to the northwest at 14 miles per hour, so that's towards the Mexico-Texas border. So we do at least have the potential for more significant rainfall there, especially in that area where that development zone is listed from Brownsville southward. That is the greatest area of concern. And Tom, you were mentioning the flash flood threat. Now, this is not from that tropical disturbance. This is totally Totally separate, and it's been plaguing areas of Arizona for a while now. Notice we have a flash flood warning right around Tucson, too, and this heavy rain threat is going to continue this weekend. Okay, so you set up my next question then. If it's not coming from that tropical storm yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico, <laughs> where is all this rain coming from? Well, there was a tropical entity, if you want to call it. It wasn't like a storm or a hurricane or anything like that. But there was a pool of tropical moisture that went through South Texas about three or four days ago. That went through Mexico, up into areas of Arizona, and now that is going to be on the move, and that's going to be the concern. So we have the 9 million people that are included in our flash flood watch, and it's already pouring from Tucson northwards up into areas around Pine Top to Flagstaff, and now the rain is also moving through New Mexico. This is great. This area has been in a horrific drought, but we don't want flash flooding. And so for for Saturday, all of this moisture is going to be from Tucson to just south of Albuquerque. And then it's on the move Sunday into areas of Texas. Watch out from Lubbock to Wichita Falls to Dallas. You're at a slight risk. And this area is under extreme drought. So you're going to go from extreme drought to at least the potential for some flooding. And we could even see some significant rainfall out of this. Um, the best chance of that flash flooding would be the I-35 corridor from Dallas to San Antonio. We call that flash flood alley, Tom. It has a lot of clay in the soil. So when it rains really hard, hard. It doesn't absorb it. It just kind of runs off quickly. So that's what we'll be watching as we go into the weekend. Uh, our friends in Texas, they're, they're going to dance. They love, they need the rain, but they don't want it all at one time. Yeah, well, listen, uh, if you've ever spent any time in that part of the country, you know in the summer they can get literally these these gushers that come in, right? And they, they just yeah. fill up all of, the, uh, all of the gullies with massive amounts of water. Okay, how long now can we expect that we'll see this widespread drought condition persist? This isn't going to alleviate the drought. 
No, this will take a dent out of it. You know, some of these areas are, you know, 10, 15 inches behind on rainfall. So, you know, that map shows you where the drought is across the country. And we've been talking about California and Nevada for a long time. But Oklahoma and Texas just stick right out with all the bright reds. There's also that developing drought in areas of the northeast. So as we go through the weekend, we track that flooding and the potential for the heavy rain from New Mexico. Then on Sunday, we move it into areas of Oklahoma and Texas. And looking at the long term, towards the end of August and also also, as we go into areas of, uh, you know, maybe the beginning of September, we're going to be cooler than average in a big chunk of the what we call the heat belt of the country, the area that suffered from such a horrific uh, period. And we're also going to increase your rain chances in the next six to 10 days. So we're not going to get rid of the drought, but we could take a good chunk and dent out of it in certain areas. At least that's what we're that's hoping. That's not bad. I mean, we'll take cooler and wetter for a no. little while, right? We, we, we paid <laughs> the price already. All right, Bill. Thanks very much. Bill yes. Kierens, have a good weekend, buddy. Thank you. Good. All right. On the heels from weather to travel, on the heels of a season of travel trouble uh, that has left hundreds of thousands of passengers stranded and stuck this summer, the Department of Transportation is today out with an ultimatum to the airlines. Improve your customer service or the government will move forward with orders that will, in fact, increase customer service under a government regulation. The DOT wants airlines to refund passengers money and offer meal vouchers if a domestic flight is delayed more than three hours. It also wants airlines to provide hotel accommodations if a flight is delayed overnight. And because airline policies about cash refunds and vouchers can be so confusing, the DOT is rolling out a website in two weeks. Listen to this. This Friday before Labor Day, so two weeks from today, with one-stop shopping that will spell out precisely what each airline's policies are on refunds, on vouchers, etc. DOT Secretary Pete Buttigieg tells me it's time for airlines to do better. So you're saying you're calling on the airlines to either voluntarily meet these requirements and regulations or you're going to do it for them? That's right. I'm giving them an opportunity to raise the bar. I hope that they take it. But we're also going to continue exploring further rulemakings so that passengers don't have to wonder uh, what, how they're going to be treated when they book a flight. Remember, uh, airlines are, are selling tickets. They're collecting revenue based on the idea that they're going to get you from point A to point B. They need to be prepared to deliver on that. All right. Well, the airlines insist they already follow government regulations about cash refunds, but they are willing to work with the government to improve transparency on their travel refund and voucher policies. We will have a full report, including our exclusive interview with Secretary Buttigieg tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Coming up on News Now, a new study that says nearly half of global cancer deaths are linked to things that we can prevent. What you can do to reduce the risk. Plus, if you see them, kill them. We're talking about spotted lantern flies, and they're really, really bad bugs. That could cost the economy hundreds of millions of dollars. And they've been seen in a dozen states already. So what's being done to stop them coming up next? back. Have you heard about the spotted lantern fly? They're kind of pretty. They've got bright red wings, but the message is if you see one, squash it because they're an invasive pest from Asia and they are spreading quickly across the country. They have been seen now in at least 12 states in the Northeast. Spotted lantern flies first showed up in the U.S. back in 2014 in Pennsylvania. They probably hitched a ride on a shipment of landscaping stones from Asia. They're not harmful to people. They won't bite you. They won't sting you. But they are a massive threat to the U.S. economy, to U.S. agriculture. These bugs have a big appetite. They are destroying trees and crops. The threat is so big right now. New York Senator Chuck Schumer is asking for $22 million to exterminate them. Now, over on TikTok, folks are sharing their own technologies for getting rid of the bugs, like catching them on sticky tape and giving it a really a good, just a good stop. NBC's Jesse Kirsch joins me now from just outside of Cleveland. Jesse, I'm guessing you've stomped on a few. How do these bugs do their damage? Well, Tom, we've been on the lookout. Luckily, I have not come across any yet, but we are ready to go. We've got our fly swatter. <laughs> we even have a, a dust buster out here. We've got all the, we love a good prop, right? We are ready to go. And this is what officials are telling us to do. People from parks departments, entomologists, bug experts, uh, right? A sender. We have people telling us, 
to kill these bugs if you see them. That is how concerning these are right now. Uh, and, and the risk is that they can easily transport on a lot of flat surfaces. So one entomologist we talked with said that it's possible that they could lay eggs on, let's say, your RV if you're going on a family vacation. Well, if you drive into another state, they could be coming with you to that new state. And they wound up here in Ohio, uh, one local park believes, because they made their way on the train heading west, and they've gone all the way west to Indiana. So that's that's the scope of the problem right now. And at risk is potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in the U.S. economy each year by some estimates. So this is a potential to impact a lot of industries, including logging, vineyards, the wine industry. So things that people care about for multiple reasons. And then, of course, there are all the species of plant that we just love to admire, too, that are at risk here, Tom. That fly swatter, by the way, looks like a tennis racket, Jesse. I've never seen anything that big. But these bugs... I'm ready for the Open. I'm ready for the U.S. Open. (laughs) Okay, good. You may need it if these things keep growing. These bugs aren't long-distance flyers, though, really. So how are they spreading if they they really don't fly? I mean, you mentioned hitching a ride on somebody's RV. Is that what they're thinking? They kind of are hitching a ride on humans? Yeah, so the USDA says that they are native to China, Uh, As you mentioned, they appear to have come over here first in 2014, and that is how we believe they have been spreading is these eggs, which it's funny. We were able to look at some of them uh, in photographs and and, uh, something they had behind a a picture frame at a park yesterday, and it looks like just some moldy bark. It's not even something that would necessarily catch your eye, and it's easy enough for these things to hang around your, your tailpipe on an RV, something like that. And so if you're trying to spot them, you may not necessarily spot them right away, but those wings are easy to spot. And you, again, you want to stomp on them, Tom. All right, so the telltale sign is that red. The red is what we should look for. Jesse, thank you. Jesse Kirsch, who is outside of Cleveland for us. All right, moving on to the uh, five things our team thinks you should know about, not just those those bugs. Number one, the drought in Spain, now so bad that the so-called Spanish Stonehenge is fully exposed. It's usually covered by a reservoir, and it's only been fully visible like this four times since archaeologists spotted it back in 1926. Uh, Authorities believe it dates back to 5000 B.C. Number two, PFAS are often called forever chemicals, and they're linked to things like low birth weight, thyroid disease, increased risk of some cancers. In a new study, researchers at Northwestern University say these kinds of harmful chemicals can be broken down using relatively harmless things, like a chemical that's used to make soap and another one that's approved as a medication for a bladder syndrome. Before this, the only other way to destroy PFAS was to incinerate them. All right, number three, the Wall Street Journal reporting Regal Cinema's owner, Cineworld, is preparing to file for bankruptcy. It's reportedly struggling to get attendance back to pre-pandemic levels. Earlier this week, the company said recent admissions were lower than expected because of a, quote, limited film slate. NBC News has reached out to Cineworld for comment. It is the second biggest cinema's chain in the world world after AMC. Number four, online voting in the USA mullet championship. Yes, mullets. Look at that. Uh, The championship ended tonight. Now, it ends tonight, I should say. Look at this. Winners get cash prizes and some swag. Part of the entry fees do go to various charities and we can try to take a page. Number five, Japan's government has launched a contest to get young people, listen to this, to drink more alcohol. Why? Because of declining liquor sales, which has had a huge impact on tax revenue in Japan. Now Japan's tax agency wants people to submit plans to help the industry. The campaign, though, has received criticism online, including from people who say it's promoting an unhealthy habit. Okay, on the topic of alcohol, some alarming numbers today from a new study suggesting nearly half of cancer deaths around the world can be attributed to things that we can prevent, like smoking, drinking, and being overweight. Now, the research was published in the medical journal The Lancet. Scientists looked at cancer deaths in 2019 and found that 44% of them had preventable risk factors. Now, that's more than 4 million deaths. And from 2010 to 2019, cancer deaths linked to those factors went up 20 percent. Dr. John Torres is joining us now from, are you Colorado or New York today, John? 
I'm in Colorado, Tom, enjoying the weather here. I know you're in God's country. All right. Well, listen, uh, modifying behavior, I guess, could lead to millions more lives being saved. Right. That's the bottom line of the study. Exactly, Tom. And just like you talked about earlier, this study at the University of Washington found that in 2019, almost 50 percent, so 44 percent of cancer deaths, which is now the second leading cause of death here in the U.S., 44.4 percent of those cancer deaths are from these preventable causes, smoking, alcohol use and high BMIs. And researchers are saying, you know, these are mostly preventable if we do a public health initiative to try and get these more under control. And like you mentioned, the concerning thing is uh, the advances they've had in those numbers since 2010 to 2019, a 20% acceleration in those numbers, they think that'll continue throughout. And so what they're saying is, yes, let's, we need to get more public health initiatives to get these under controls. And the last story you talked about, you know, the Japan trying to promote alcohol, you know, that's kind of going counter to what these, uh, yeah. these authors are saying here these researchers and so now we know you know looking at these numbers which ended up being over four million cancer deaths per year because of the three factors hopefully you can pull some of those back and get some of those people to understand what they need to do to prevent these you know tobacco has been linked to cancer for years right for more than half a century we've known that but tobacco use in the united states it's lower here but it's it's a lot higher in other countries and we're still seeing an increase in deaths overseas i wonder why other countries are still still very much in tobacco's grip in many cases you know, Tom, there's a lot of reasons and a lot of factors behind this. And part of it is the chasing of demographics because, you know, public health officials have done a good job here in the U.S. of making tobacco, you know, look like the issue that it is for health purposes and saying, you know, we need to get it under control. And then legislation has come in restricting it for certain ages. Taxes have come in. Other countries aren't doing quite that as much. And the tobacco country companies know that, you know, if they can't target it here, they can target it in other countries. And so yeah. it's almost like chasing the ball, trying to get it under control. And I think over time that will happen. It's just going to take a little while and a concerted effort to make sure it does happen. All right. I want to talk to you about this Gallup poll. Sixty percent of Americans say that they drank alcohol last year. That's down from 65 percent in 2019. Again, five percent drop and 67 percent in 2010. So we see a decline. It's not the lowest it's ever been, but it looks like we are trending down. Any idea why that is happening? And could studies like this kind of extend that trend, convince people to kind of back off alcohol? You know, I think that trend might be extended a little bit, but also you have to remember we're starting to socialize more. When we socialize, oftentimes we tend to do that around alcohol, which is not something that happened during the pandemic. And so I think that was what was happening behind the pandemic of people being home alone, not necessarily drinking and re reducing the amount of drinking they did. But now they're going out and about and I th they're going to do more. So I think the message should be, hey, you know, keep that temperate. You know, make sure that's in moderation because we know that excessive drinking can help can cause problems. And now it looks like even partial drinking might be able to cause problems. So keep an eye on it, Tom. Dr. John Torres at the Monument Colorado Bureau for NBC News. Dr. John, thanks much. <laughs> when we come back, some families in Texas making the hard choice to move away so they can get better care for their kids who have disabilities. In our backstory tonight, we're getting into why there could be a decades long wait for help. Stay with us for that. We are back and it's time to get to the back story, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. This week, NBC News has had special coverage of kids under pressure, stories about how inflation and rising costs are squeezing families and their support systems. Today, we are taking an in-depth look at a Houston Chronicle investigation that found families with children who have intellectual and developmental disabilities are leaving the state of Texas to find better care for their kids. According to the report, Texas is able to serve less than a fifth of the families who have children with disabilities. NBC News reached out to the state in a statement and officials said waitlist slots are offered based on available funding. One family the Chronicle talked to was reportedly informed by the state that they would have to wait on a list for 10 years to get services for their three autistic children. So the Brundage family packed up and moved to Minnesota where they say they received immediate services, including a fence around their home to make sure that the kids don't wander away, a trampoline so that the kids stay active outside. And the Brundage family says the state of Minnesota even paid mom, Shaletta, 
uh, to stay at home to care for her children, something she says would have never happened back in Texas. So let's bring in now Alex Stuckey. He's an investigative reporter for the Houston Chronicle who talked with the family, pardon me, she, not he, and so many others about the lack of care for children who have an intellectual and disability, uh, developmental disability. Uh, Alex, how do you find out, how did you find the family to begin with, the Brundage family, and then what led you to look into the lack of disability services in Texas? So I've been writing a lot about mental health care across the state um, for the past three-ish years. And so um, this story kind of came to me um, through, you know, tips from people just about this really long wait list. And I was kind of holding on to it, waiting for the right family, um, found a family and wrote about them. And after I wrote about the, you know, up to 20 year wait list, I started receiving a lot of messages from families who said, yeah, like it's actually worse. And so the Brundages were a family that reached out to me and said, Hey, like we actually moved because, um, we couldn't get services and, you know, turns out they're not the only ones. Um, and I yeah. found that a lot of people that had the appropriate means were leaving the state. You know, Alex, what's fascinating about how our business has changed over the last few years is you put something out now, it goes viral, right? It's not just on today's newspaper. It's not just on NBC News today. It lives in the Internet and it takes on a life of its own. And so is that how you are hearing from more and more families? Yeah, actually, um, you know, some of it is some of my own reporting going into like autism and other disability Facebook groups and asking for families. But you know, a lot of it is the the stories blow up, especially yeah. on Twitter. And, and you hear from a lot of families that way. Yeah, uh, I, I, the same thing happens when we do stories. Now, were state agencies cooperative with you in getting answers for your story and for the families? Or were they maybe a little defensive? You know, um, I've been dealing with this particular agency for three years now, and um, they have still not allowed me to speak on the record with an expert within their agency uh, at all. So it's all over email. You know, they're very slow to respond. It's it's everything is sort of treated as a public records request and they take their time. So so they do answer my questions, but not really in the way that I would, you know, maybe hope that they would. Is there another shoe to drop very quickly? Um, You know, I'm I'm continuing continuing to write about this topic and and hoping that, you know, the the legislature meets every two years and next year is one of those years. And so I'm hoping that, you know, I can get enough momentum that we see some change um, legislatively. It's tenacious journalism like yours, Alex, that can make incremental change and make a difference. Thank you. Alex Stuckey coming to us from Texas. Coming up, uh, this man, take a look, arrested in Pennsylvania for what a district attorney is calling one of the most bizarre investigations he's ever encountered. That story is in the local tonight. Plus, a new kind of army is mobilizing in Ukraine. How young people are building their country back up in our original. So stay with us. All right, we are back. Listen, if you've got an Apple device, and a whole lot of you have to have them, right now, pull it out. We're going to show you something. Pull it out right now. We want to make sure that you've got the latest update because the world's largest tech company is warning of a new vulnerability that could let a hacker completely control your phone, your iPad, or your Mac. Now, this statement from Apple on its iOS 15 is making waves online today. It says hackers may have actually exploited, quote, executive arbitrary code through maliciously crafted web content. Now, in non-computer speak, that means somebody could get full access to your device. It's raising major red flags, especially given Apple's expressed commitment to protect your privacy. NBC's Kevin Collier is following this for us. Okay, we've got our phones out, Kevin. Before we do anything, I want you right now to help us through this right now. We want to do the software upgrade, update. What do we do? I held off on updating mine uh just for this, um, okay. you pull out your phone, you go yeah. to uh, settings, um, uh, go to general, yep. and then you see um, the option to do a software update. Yes. Uh, click that, and then download and install. Uh, you maybe have already gotten a prompt for this. Hopefully, Tom, that you do this uh, regularly every time there is one of these. Uh, but if not, this is 
there's no time like the present to learn. This is a uh, kind of basic cyber hygiene that everybody, I hope all of our viewers uh, do this regularly. And if you don't already yes. make a habit of this, this is how you stay ahead of the hackers. All right. I've got a company phone. I've got automatic updates on, but it still did. Up, I did this earlier today. It still did update my phone. Yes. Good. Then you are you are uh, set. Sometimes you will. It will happen automatically eventually, but you can go ahead and do it now if it hasn't happened yet. OK. So, again, go through these steps, update your software. Don't delay. Tell the kids, tell your, your mom, tell everybody do this. Now, how worried should we be about this flaw? Apple clearly is trying to raise the red the red flag here. Uh, let, let's say medium. Um, this happens maybe a couple times a year that there's a, a flaw like this. Uh, this update in particular addresses what they call a zero day in the wild, um, which means that um, there's code that Apple just learned about today. They have zero days to to kind of plan to fix it. And in the wild means that hackers are exploiting it uh, actively. Uh, the good news is we're not seeing any reports of, of kind of mass exploitation. And as we just addressed, you can fix it right now. You can go ahead and inoculate yourself right now. Hey, Kevin, you know, Apple's worth two point six trillion dollars. It's got all the resources it could ever want. Why can't it stay ahead of the hackers who are I don't know where they are anywhere in the world, somebody's basement or they're part of a Russian bot machine. But why do they struggle to stay ahead of this? Uh, well, you know, this is this is cybersecurity in action. Apple's got some of the best software engineers on the planet, uh, but software just by definition is never going to be perfectly safe. It's never going to be perfectly unhackable. This is the sort of thing where there's always going to be this. You know, there are intelligence agencies. There are entire companies that build spyware that sell access that are constantly 24 seven trying to find new ways to exploit software like Apple iOS. Um, and Apple has to just kind of play defense. Occasionally, the bad guys get through and write a patch for you to be able to uh, kind of block them from getting in yeah. into the latest thing they found. All right, buddy. Last time, I'm just going to remind the audience, if they didn't have their phone out in time, you go to settings, go to general. Then in general, you go down software update and you update. Take the Apple update and you're going to be glad you did, right? Yes, indeed. Thanks, Tom. All right. Kevin, have a good weekend. Thank you, sir. NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day. And because you could not possibly read, watch or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you and for me. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions. And it's a segment we call the local. From our West Coast Bureau, three people died after two small planes crashed into each other in a midair accident at an airport in Northern California. The crash happened at Watsonville Municipal Airport Thursday as the planes were trying to land. It isn't clear what caused the crash. The NTSB is investigating. From our Northeast Bureau, this Pennsylvania gentleman is facing multiple charges after he allegedly tried to buy stolen human body parts online. Police found buckets of body parts in the home of Jeremy Lee Pauly and intercepted a package for him from a woman in Arkansas. Now, she allegedly stole the body parts from a mortuary. Pauly is said to have been arraigned or maybe to have arranged through Facebook, uh, through Facebook Messenger, to pay this woman $4,000 for the body parts and intended to resell them. One of our studio guys is shaking his head here. He is currently released on bond. Also from our Northeast Bureau, look at this video of a former power plant in Baltimore turning into rubble. A demolition crew used explosives to implode the facility in just seconds. Neighbors say the current property owner possibly plans to build housing on the land. Pretty cool. All right, now we want to bring you today's original with an in-depth report on a topic we've been keeping an eye on here. It is, of course, the war in Ukraine. Now, earlier we told you that the country is bracing for a possible Russian attack at a nuclear power plant. It would add even further to the destruction that so much of the country has seen in nearly six months since the war began. But a new kind of army is at work in the wreckage of Russia's war, an army of young volunteers. They call it Repair Together. It's a group of teenagers and 20-somethings coming to the aid of fellow Ukrainians. They spend their days cleaning up bombed-out homes. NBC's Josh Letterman is there with more. It's early on a Sunday morning in Ivanivka, but a group of young Ukrainians is already awake, ready to work. In a village devastated by Russian artillery, 69-year-old Olya Lazarenko is waiting for them. This used to be your, your kitchen. In what's left of the home she and her husband built 45 years ago. 
She says, I cried all day yesterday because everything is lost. There's nothing left. But now a new kind of army is fighting in Ukraine. Not to tear down, but to build up what's been lost. It's called Repair Together, a band of teenagers and 20-somethings finding their own way to fight for their country's future. The group says more than 1,500 Ukrainians have stepped up in cities across Ukraine, mostly connecting through Instagram. At some events, the cleanups turn into a rave, DJs spinning techno. Irina Lialik came to Ivanivka from Lviv, more than 400 miles away in the relative safety of Western Ukraine. I really needed to help somehow. And uh, donating money is nice, I do that, but it doesn't fill enough. So I wanted to come here and do something with my bare hands. Seeing the hope and optimism as these Ukrainians clean up and rebuild, you could almost forget that there's a war still raging. But there are reminders here that this war is far from over. As Darina Tischenko works in the summer sun, her thoughts are in southern Ukraine where two months ago her dad was serving in the special forces. He exploded uh, on the mine, yeah, and uh, yeah, no one survived that operation. And for me, being here, it's also to continue uh, his uh, ideas, his beliefs. He put himself at risk because he yeah. wanted yeah. to do this work. Ukraine's government says at least 140,000 homes have been destroyed in this war so far, leaving three and a half million people homeless. Like Olya and her husband Grigory, now living with neighbors, their grandson fighting on the front lines. But amid the grief and piles of dusty rubble, there is still hope in Ukraine. She says, I can only thank them so much for coming here and helping us. My husband and I wouldn't be able to do anything here by ourselves. We don't want to wait to the end of the war and then start rebuilding. Even if, God forbid, this house gets attacked another time, I will come here another time and rebuild it twice. Josh Letterman, NBC News, Ivanivka, Ukraine. There is still good in the world. Coming back, we'll be back with just a minute with more news. Okay, okay, okay. Here's a story you might text your friends about over the weekend. A recent article from Psychology Today is lighting up conversations online. The rise of lonely single men. The author talks about how dating apps and relationship standards have drastically changed dating realities today. And according to him, straight men are feeling the impacts of this. The piece lays out the data that young and middle-aged men are the loneliest they've ever been in generations. But experts tell us there's some nuance to these findings. So Maya Eaglin has the story. It's an article that sparked a debate. My feed has been filled with women, with men, talking about this Psychology Today article. I feel like every time I opened any social media app, it was the top post. Titled, The Rise of Lonely Single Men. Folks across Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram are jumping into the discussion. Now I share science-based relationship advice with you on TikTok. Author and psychologist Greg Matto says three big trends are making the relationship landscape for heterosexual men difficult. Dating apps, women upping their standards, and men's skill deficit. This is just the beginning of women asking for things from their partner aside from the bare minimum. Sociologist Natasha Quadlin of UCLA says that bigger changes in society like the Me Too movement have impacted relationships. Women have become more vocal about their experiences with sexual assault and sexual harassment. We're seeing generational differences in terms of how we approach mate selection and how we approach dating partners. Millennials are now less likely to be married with kids and more likely to be living with a romantic partner partner instead, according to Pew. And the number of unpartnered men now at the highest level in decades at 39 percent. But psychologist David Swanson says remembering dating fundamentals can lead to better outcomes. All you have to do is to be nice and to be honest. It, that is the, the, the best way to get a real connection. Anxiety does lead to a shutting down of those skills. And I think you get that skill deficit from some of that anxiety. The article has caused a lot of buzz, but also a lot of backlash. Matos has even received hate mail. Why? When all I'm doing is asking you to be the best version of yourself. 
Experts are quick to note that men's reported loneliness impacts everyone, not just men. I'm sure that there are indeed some women who have impossibly high standards, just as there are some men who have impossibly high standards, whether it's you know physical standards or emotional standards. But I think that moments like these are times to perhaps be introspective about ways that we can become better <laughs> as people. We live in a society and... Therefore, we are all connected. And I think it's important to remember that when one group is experiencing something um, that is difficult, it really impacts all of us and will have ripple effects on all of us. All right. So Maya Eaglin is uh, joining us now. First of all, you got to figure maybe the birth rate would drop if men are increasingly on their own. But there are different tiers when it comes to dating apps, right, where people get access to more features if they're willing to pay. What kind of impact does this all have on people's ability to to connect with one another? So there's pros and cons to that. Obviously, the positive, you might be entering a dating pool where more singles are serious about dating. But on the flip side, maybe there could be some incredible people who just can't afford to enter, you know, the higher premium packages. We did reach out to Matos for this and haven't heard back yet. But the overall takeover, takeaway from this, and I know this from my circles too in Gen Z, you have to take accountability for your mental well-being, mm-hmm. your emotional intelligence, and being a true partner. Can I say happy anniversary to my wife tomorrow? Yes. 28 years. Oh, my All gosh. Right, congratulations. Maya. Thank you, Maya. Have a great weekend. That's a wrap for us this hour. We're going to have much more for you right here on Monday. Same time, same place. Coverage, though, picks up right now.